Lord's already done so much. I'm so grateful. Wow. We were singing that song, All is for His Glory, and my heart was so tender. I'm like, yes, Lord. This is why we're here. This is why I'm here. It's for your glory, that chorus, put me anywhere, but put your glory in me. Put me anywhere. Just put your glory in me. Isn't that the cry of our heart? I'll go where you call me. I'll serve where you serve, but I want to serve knowing your presence, being a man filled with your glory. Uh, that song was written by a friend of Rachel and I's in Kansas City, Lisa Gottschall, and she has four beautiful kids, and she's a stay-at-home mom, and she wrote that at her piano as she was mothering her children, saying, all is for your glory. And she was thinking about raising her children to be disciples of the Lord, and just such a precious song that came from a place of humility, just a mom going, this is what I want to do. I want to live and be about your glory. So I want to encourage you mothers who are raising small children or teenagers and point them to the glory of the Lord. Point them to the preeminence of Jesus. I mean, I love that that phrase came from a mom. I want my kids to know the preeminence of Jesus. I want them to know his supremacy in all things. Isn't that wonderful? So, we're going to get into the, the word right now. You can turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. That's where we're going to uh, kind of, that'll be our foundation this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we will... Stay in seven verses, the first seven verses. I'm just going to read it real quick, and then we will pray. Let's read all seven verses. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Lord, I I take this last verse right now. As we think over what Paul said here, we ask you to give us understanding. As we set our minds on your word and on the message that Paul was speaking to his son, his friend, his child, Timothy, Lord, we ask you to grant us understanding. And this understanding, let it lead to action. Let it lead to application. Let it lead to us being conformed into your image. We need strength, Lord. And we want to have the right mentality in this life. So we pray that you would do this in the name of Jesus. Verse 1 says, You then, my child be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul is calling Timothy his child. Timothy and Paul, they, 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 Paul found Timothy in Acts chapter 16 at Lystra, and he was a man of good reputation, and he came from a believing family. It says his faith was passed down to him from his grandmother to his mother and then to him. We don't know if Timothy's father was a believer or not. The language in in Acts 16 seems to suggest that he had passed away. The language in the Greek does. So this faithful grandmother and this faithful mother are raising Timothy in the ways of the Lord. It looks like they were saved before Paul got there. And he had a good reputation. And Paul 
took him under his wing. Now, now think about this. Paul is on missionary journeys. He's not like, like, he's not offering discipleship to Timothy, just like, you know, come beside me and come to my local church and we'll do things. I mean, Paul is about to go to Philippi and be put in prison, and that's going to be Timothy's introduction to ministry. To see Paul turn and rebuke a demon out of a young girl, set her free, and then her slave owners are so mad that they're losing their source of income that he's beaten with rods, he's taken before the authorities, he's put into prison. And then, of course, he sings the songs of the Lord in prison, begins to sing hymns and give thanks to God with Silas. And those prison doors are shaken, and Paul is released by the power of God. That's Timothy's introduction to ministry. That's crazy. (laughs) Paul calls Timothy his, his child here. Let's go to slide three and four. Slide three says, this is Philippians 2. This is Paul speaking of Timothy to the Philippian church. This is a high compliment Paul pays Timothy. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him he who, will, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Verse 21, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying, Timothy, I have no one like Timothy. He doesn't seek his own interests. He seeks those of Jesus Christ. Now, earlier in this chapter, Paul's saying, do not seek your own interests, but also the interests of others, and have no ambition for yourself, but have your ambition be to look and to act like Jesus, who laid down his life, who became a servant, and God exalted him. And Paul's saying, Timothy is one in my midst who does this. He is looking like Jesus. He is acting like Jesus. And he is wanting Jesus' interests. Jesus' will manifest and not his own. Let's go to the next slide. I love how Paul talks of Timothy here in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. He says, you, that's Timothy, you, however, have followed my teaching." So it's not that Timothy just heard Paul's teaching. He's following Paul's teaching. Now, we got to remember here that Timothy and Paul ministered together for 15 years. When Paul wrote this letter, they had been in relationship and been in ministry together for 15 years. That's the book of Ephesians. That's Philippians. That's Colossians. That's Corinthians. That's the book of Romans. That's basically our entire New Testament. Paul's saying, Timothy, you followed my teaching. And not only have you followed my teaching, you've acted like me. You followed my contact, my, my conduct. You have taken on my aim in life as your aim in life, which was to serve Jesus and to preach the gospel to the nations. You've followed my faith. You've followed my patience, or you've had the same endurance that I've had. You followed my love and my steadfastness, and you followed my persecutions and my sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra. And I feel like that's just kind of where Paul stops. He could have gone on at Thessalonica, at Philippi, at Corinth, at Ephesus. He just was like, the letter's going to be too long if I go into the persecution thing. I already did that in 2 Corinthians, so I'm not going to give that to you right now, Timothy. But... He says, Timothy, you followed me. So I just want to make that point. Timothy's not just a student of the message. He's embraced the message. To the point where Paul says, I've imitated Christ and you've imitated me. And we are one in our ministry aim together. Isn't that beautiful? Fathers, mothers, grandfathers, grandmothers. Take some young ones by your side and say, follow me as I follow Christ. Have a voice in their life. This, Paul acknowledging Timothy and saying, I want to pour into this young man, change the course of human history. He was passing it 
on to a son. And this whole letter, oh, guys, I've read this, I've read this a lot over the last couple of weeks. I can't get through it just at some point without crying. Just thinking of Paul sitting in prison. It's his last time to be in prison. Paul spent five and a half years of his life in prison. Did you know that? Five and a half years of his life sitting in a prison cell at different times, not all at one time. But if you add up the time, it's like between five and a half and six years. And the conservative side is about five and a half years. And he's in prison for the last time. And he's giving his final instructions to his son. And his heart is that the church would stay steady, that the church would stay faithful. Let's move on. The next slide. He says, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So he calls Timothy his child, and then he says, my child, you got to be strong. you got to be strengthened. Now, Paul gave this command a lot. The command is to be strengthened. But how many of you know we cannot fulfill that commandment on our own? The command is be strong, but then Paul here says, by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 6, he says, be strong, and then he says, in the Lord and in the power of his might. I love how the Passion Translation points this out. Slide 9. Mike was pointing this out to me. Now, my beloved ones, I have saved these most important truths for the last. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Supernaturally infused with strength through our life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in and through you. Now, this command to be strong in God, this command to be strengthened in the Lord, this, is, this has been um, so st- such a key in my own life. I begin to, to read this as a young man, be strong, be strengthened. And the way that I began to embrace this was to ask for it. Just to simply say, Lord, make me strong in you. Lord, strengthen me in you. And then I found prayers in the New, in the New Testament that cry out for the same thing. It's funny because Paul commands Timothy to be strong, commands the Ephesians to be strong, but then when he prays for them, this is what he's praying for them for. He's asking God to make them strong. I love it. Slide 11, Colossians. No, I'm sorry. Let's go back to slide 10. Colossians 1, 11. Paul says this. He said, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. That's how he's praying for them. But that being strengthened, that reality that is happening on being strengthened, go to the slide back, uh, back one slide, yeah. Being strengthened with all power, that happens by what he's asking from before. Now let's go to verses 9 and 10. Paul says, He's asking that the church of Colossae would be filled with the knowledge of his will or with the intimate experience of his desires and that they would be filled with this in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So when we get that pouring into us, when we begin to ask, Lord, give me understanding to your will, to your desires, what do you want for my life? What do you want for my family? What do you want for this city? What do you want for this church? Fill me with the knowledge of your desires. I lay down my own desires. Not my will, Lord, but yours be done. Fill me with your desires. And then we ask for it and give us all spiritual wisdom and understanding to accomplish it. Verse 10 is what we're going to start to do. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. And how are we going to fully please him? It goes on. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. 
It's what we were talking about last week that Mike led us through so wonderfully. It's being, it's bearing fruit in every good work. And in that bearing fruit in good works, we are going to be filled and experience the knowledge of God. So then Paul says, being strengthened. That was the first slide we got in. I want that strength, right? So I just, as a young man, begin to ask for this, and I'm still asking for this. I pray this fresh every single time, because in every different season of my life, I need greater strength, right? Paul goes into it again in Ephesians, but we're not going to, we don't have time to go there. So a, a good question to ask is, why does Timothy need strength? Why does Timothy need to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might? One answer, or the answer that this text gives us, is that Timothy needs power to entrust the gospel to faithful men. He's going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. He's going to need the grace that is in Lord Jesus to entrust the gospel toward, to faithful men. But the historical context where Paul is writing, it's, it's pretty grim for the church. Paul is sitting in prison in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. We know that Paul knows that his life is it's, it's about to end. He's already being poured out like a drink offering. He's fought the fight, past tense, fought the fight. He's kept the faith, past tense, kept the faith. And he knows he's about to give his life to the Lord. What had happened was Nero, the persecution of Emperor Nero had risen up. Nero wanted to, Nero was insane, by the way, and he wanted to totally rebuild Rome. So to do this, he just decided to set fire to Rome, and about three-fourths of it burnt to the ground. He tried to do it in a secret way. When it got out and he was being blamed for it, he decided to blame the Christians. It was this secret sect of, of believers that are, that are meeting in secret, and they did this, and this persecution, this crazy persecution breaks out all through the Roman Empire. And, of course, the famous stories are uh, Nero sewing up Christians alive in animal skins and bathing them with blood and then making, hung, making lions go days without food and wild beasts go days without food and then sicking the wild beasts on the, on the Christians. Or the, he would make these wax shirts and he would hang the Christians in his garden and he'd light them on fire and they would be the, the torches for his garden. I mean, just terrible stuff. Those are, the, of course, the most famous stories. But this persecution of the Christians was going out, was going and was pretty rampant throughout all of uh, the Roman Empire. So it's Paul's writing Timothy in a time where he might have to endure this persecution. He might have to suffer for the name of Jesus. And he might have to do what Paul's doing and being in prison and giving his life. And Paul is exhorting Timothy. In, Second Tim in the book of 2 Timothy. Timothy, if you got to do this, remember, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. He goes on in chapter 1 and he says, Timothy, if you suffer, guess what you get to suffer by? You get to suffer by the power of God infusing you for suffering. Now, we pray for the power of God all the time, but how many of us pray, Lord, give me power to suffer for your name? But Paul's experience is this, Timothy, if you embrace suffering and if you endure, you're going to experience Jesus standing beside you, giving you strength. You're going to experience that supernatural infusing of strength from your life union with Jesus Christ. We have a vision for power in the West, and I love our vision for power, power evangelism, power in healing, power in ministry. But I sat one time with a group of five Christian leaders in Hong Kong, and I witnessed five men who had experienced the
the power to suffer for the name of Jesus. They had all had their different times in prison. And I was sitting at that table going, I don't know why I'm here. I should not be here. This is crazy. Let's keep going. So there's, there was persecution arising, and there was a lot of false teaching arising in the church. There was the false teaching of legalism. The Judaizers were trying to bring people back to the law. There was the false teaching of the, uh, uh, the theological term is antinomianism, but it just means without law. <laughs> that once you get into the kingdom, anything goes. We deal a little bit more in the West, I think, with the anti-law than with the legalism part. At least my generation deals with the, has dealt with the anti-law a little bit more. And Paul addresses this in Romans chapter 6. He says, Do, we don't sin so that grace may abound. We become slaves to righteousness and we bring our bodies into submission to the Lord and we obey him in everything. That's what Paul's addressing in Romans chapter 6 to the, to the Gentile church who was trying to get into the kingdom and then say, now there's just grace for everything. That's been around for a long time, by the way. And there was this quarreling about words and this irreverent babbling and myths and fables and endless genealogies that Paul goes into in, in a 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus. And he says, some of these, let's go to slide 14. Some of these, their, their talk had spread like gangrene. Among them are, I'm not going to even try, verse 18, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. And there are other biblical New Testament examples of these, these uh, false teachings that were arising in the church. I mean, Paul has to put an end to it in Thessalonica. The, the, the Thessalonians started to say that Jesus had already come back and the resurrection had already happened. These guys are saying the resurrection, well, these guys are saying that as well, that the resurrection has already happened. And, and Jesus is, and Paul says, it, it, it hasn't. Jesus hasn't returned yet. You didn't miss it. Anyway, beautiful encouragement. So it's, it's a pretty dire day. And Paul's in prison. Here's, here's what persecution and heresy had produced in the church. Let's go to slide 15. In Acts 19.10, this is a powerful verse. Paul is in Ephesus, and he's in Ephesus, and he's in Ephesus. He withdraws, and he takes disciples with him, and he reasons daily in the hall of Tyrannius. And this continued for two years, and here's what happened as Paul is reasoning in the hall of Tyrannius. So that all the residents of Asia, that's Asia Minor, so think of the Middle East, so that all the residents of Asia Minor heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. What a powerful just advancement of the gospel. You know those times in the book of Acts where it's like, and the word of the Lord spread and many came into the church. This is one of them. The, Lord of the, the word of the Lord spreading to where all of Asia Minor had heard the word of the Lord. But now, Years later, let's go to this next verse. Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.15, he says, Timothy, you are, aware, you are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermonides. Okay, I tried. That, that was pretty good. All right. So there's a point in Paul's missionary journey that all of Asia Minor had heard the word of the Lord. But now, because of persecution and heresy, Paul is saying, all in Asia have turned away from me. Those leaders that I raised up, those two years that I spent discipling, this was in Corinth as well, they've turned away from him. They haven't stayed faithful. Timothy's stayed faithful. But many in Asia Minor hadn't. This wasn't in my notes, but just, just turn to chapter 1 real quick. This is unbelievable. Okay, so everyone's turning away from Paul. <laughs> his ministry, his, his, what he had poured his life out in the Gentile church, it's, it's getting bad. If I put myself in Paul's shoes, 
I would start to have these thoughts. Was it worth it? Was the life that I, the work that I did, it's, it's slipping away. And I would be prone to discouragement and depression. That's just me. I don't know about you guys. I would be very prone to discouragement. I would be very prone to depression. This is how Paul responds to this. Let's look at, oh, this is so good. Okay, verse 11 of chapter 1. Paul says, I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher of what he says in verses 8, 9, and 10. Verse 12, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of my life. I'm not ashamed of what I did, for I know whom I have believed. He's saying, that Matthew 7 thing, that's not happening to me. The Lord, Lord, we never knew you, that part thing. Paul's saying, I have known who I have believed. I have yadad who I have believed. I have intimately come into relationship with who I believed. And this is the faith that it produced in Paul. And I am convinced that he who is able that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. And just a couple of verse, verses later, he says, but all in Asia have left me. But I am convinced that the power of Jesus is able to take my work in the nations, what, what he's entrusted to me, and to continue to bring it forth. Now, I was talking about this with my wife, and she goes, wow. The Lord really answered that prayer, didn't he? The message that Jesus entrusted to Paul, how many, for how many thousands of years, how many believers have gleaned from those letters, have gleaned from that ministry? I guarantee you that was far more abundant than Paul could ask or think. And he was convinced, he was convinced that God is able to guard it. Why was he convinced? Because he knew whom he, whom he believed. Guys, we need to have a little bit more faith. Rachel and I were praying this past Monday, and we just started to pray, Lord, increase our faith. We just need to have a little bit more faith that God is able to do a little bit more abundantly than we can ask or think. To our finances, God is able to supply. God is able to bring about all sufficiency for all things so that we can do the good works he's called us to do. That's that 2 Corinthians chapter 9. God is able, guys. We need a vision for the God who is able. And in Hebrews 7, it says, He is able to save to the uttermost those who have believed in his name. Why? Because he has the power of the everlasting life, and he is ever making intercession for us. He's able to save. He's able to deliver. He's able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think through the power that is at work in us. Ephesians chapter 3. Why does he want to do this? So that to Jesus and to the Father, may there be glory through his church. I was thinking of the Matthew 9, the two blind men that come to Jesus in Matthew 9. And they're saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus is in a home and he brings him into the home. And I love this dialogue between these two blind men and to Jesus. And I was just feeling it personally for my life. Jesus says, do you think I am able to do this? That's the question he asks them. Do you think I am able to, bring, to restore your sight? And their only answer was, yes, Lord. And he says, okay, according to your faith, may it be done to you. I think the Lord is asking us that question in a lot of areas of our life. I think we need to slow down and hear the Lord saying, do you think I am able? And I think we need to add our agreement to that question. Yes, Lord, you're able. Yes, Lord, you're able. 
I think he's waiting for that dialogue. And he's like, okay, be it done to you according to your faith. Had he not had that dialogue with those two men, I mean, that, what a precious, intimate moment. So that they would know that they do believe and they do have faith and they are putting their trust in him. Ah, oh, it's just precious. Anyway, that's not in the notes, but that went, it's so fun. God is able. Amen? Just start to say that. When, when that fear creeps in, when that, when that discouragement, when that depression creeps in, just begin to confess God is able. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing before King Nebuchadnezzar. O oh, king, our God is able to deliver us from the fire. But if he doesn't, we'll never bow down to you. And God walked with them through the fire. Oh! Daniel chapter 6, Daniel, King Darius runs down to Daniel. Daniel, was your God able to deliver you? And Daniel says, yes, my God sent his angel and he shut the mouth of the lion. Ah! That is glorious. Our God is able. Amen? So Paul says, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Guys, this is what we were talking about a few weeks ago with Pastor Zach and what Mike referenced here on stage. This is that John 15. This is that, let's go to that, just those few verses out of John 15. This is the abide in me and die in you, just play, uh, slide 22, Joseph, you're doing a great job back there, buddy, thank you so much, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me, I mean, what, that is, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, we are the branch, he is the vine, we have no source of life apart from that vine. Apart from me, apart from, the, apart from me, unless, blah, 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 blah. let's go to the next verse. <laughs> I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen. So we're called to have grace. We're called to be strong through grace that is in Christ Jesus. Mike did a great job last week. Grace is the key. Grace is what raises us from the dead in Ephesians chapter 2 and sits us on his throne with Jesus. That's what grace does. But that power isn't released until we apply our faith to that grace, right? Grace is the key. Faith is is putting it in the engine or putting it in the ignition and turning it and then the power comes. That's a perfect way to describe Ephesians chapter 2. It's the grace that was provided for us. Paul says in chapter 1 here in Timothy that that grace was given to us before the ages began. Meditate on that one. That's a beautiful... He says, before the ages began... God purposed in his heart, not because of your good works, because you weren't even alive. God purposed in his heart to give you grace, and he gave it to you before the ages began. Meaning, he had the purpose of you activating the power of grace through your faith forever, for all time. And he had been thinking about it, and, and wanting it, and desiring it. So the next time you need grace, know that God's been thinking about this forever. And he has power and he has thoughts about it to give to you. So why does Timothy need grace? Let's go to the next slide, Joseph. Timothy needs grace because what he has heard from Paul, what he has heard from me, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others.
this is something that the Lord has, has just been speaking to me personally, but I believe this is, this is for our body as well. We need grace in this season. We need to press into Jesus in this season to entrust the gospel to faithful men. Jesus would say, go into the nations, baptize, teach them everything I have taught you, make disciples, for I am with you always to the end of the age. That's Jesus' language for what Paul is saying to Timothy. Timothy, you have been entrusted with the gospel. Think of the generations of entrusting that are going on here. In Galatians, it's, it's from Jesus to Paul. Jesus had been the spirit of the Lord. Jesus had entrusted the message to Paul. And Paul had done the good work of entrusting the message to Timothy. Now, it's interesting because in chapter 1, Paul says, Timothy, what has been entrusted to you, the good deposit that was made in you? He says, you've got to guard that by the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, you can't let it go. How do we guard what's been trusted to us by the power of the Holy Spirit? One, I think we just remember what we have learned. We remember how we've been discipled. This is how Paul talks in chapter 4. He says, remember what you've learned. I think it's chapter 3, actually, in 2 Timothy. Remember what you've learned. He says, remember from who you've learned it from. Remember our relationship. And then he says, and Timothy, continue in the word of God, the sacred scriptures, that you have known from your youth. And then he says, for they are profitable for encouragement, for rebuke, for exhortation. And he says, for training in righteousness, he says, they will make you complete. They will make you whole. They will make you mature. And why do we need that maturity for, oh, good, thank you, you found it, for every good work right there. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's how we keep and guard the deposit by the Holy Spirit. We stay in the Word of God, and we let the Word of God pull the good works out of us. I've had different seasons in my life, different seasons in our marriage where we've been praying about the good works, and I've experienced the Word of God giving me strength and pulling me into the good work that God was calling me to do. Whether that was moving to a different nation or coming home or, 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 or leading an internship or, or evangelizing to the person on the trail. Or, it's the word of God that pulls us and reminds us and convicts us and gives us strength for the good works ahead of us. If you, last week, walked out going, I don't know the good work that God has given me to do. And if you're in that season of praying right now, I want to encourage you, get into the word. It'll pull it out of you. Don't just read it. Think about it and pray and wait upon the Lord for revelation. And then when he gives it, commit in your heart to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm not just going to pray about it. I'm going to do it. Write down the plan. Put the text to the person that you need to talk to. Amen? We need grace to guard, but we need grace to entrust the gospel to faithful men. Paul goes on. He says, Timothy, in this entrusting, you're going to need some things. You're going to need the mind of a soldier. You're going to need the mind, that mindset of an athlete, and you're going to need the mindset of a farmer. Let's go to slide 35. No soldier, it says, gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Guys, in the entrusting, we're going to suffer a little bit. In the entrusting, we're going to have to endure a little bit. In the discipling, in the preaching, and when I say preach the gospel, I mean live it yourself, speak it to others, and then pull them into obedience by encouragement. You can't just say it, and you can't just live it, you got to pull people into obedience. you got to encourage. you got to exhort. you got to do it with all patience. you got to give people a long time. And you can't just tell them to do things 
to do something without teaching them why. This is what Paul goes into in chapter 3. He says, encourage, exhort, rebuke. But he says, but do it with all patience. I love that. Because sometimes, never mind. <laughs> do it with patience. And do it with teaching. It takes time. I think of those 15 years of Paul and Timothy. It took time. But now Timothy is ready. Ooh, that's good. And he needs the mindset of the soldier. I think of this as single-mindedness. I think of this as living a focused life. Don't waste your life on a dozen things that don't produce fruit. Focus on what really matters. The soldier is dedicated to the battle, and he's dedicated to the commander. He's dedicated to, di to the discipline needed for victory. I think we got to get the victory in our mind and go, what discipline do I need for this victory? Where do I need to say no in my life and yes to the Lord for victory? You're not going to earn it by your works, but you're going to position yourself to experience the power of God. My, I was sermon prepping with my daughter yesterday, and we went on a three-hour walk, and I think she... About an hour and a half in, she was like, why did I go on this walk with my father? <laughs> no, just play. We had a precious time. And we were praying over you guys and over the service. And, but she goes, she was thinking about World War II, and she was thinking about a, uh, a soldier going through a town in France. And, and she was like, that soldier wouldn't get caught up in the arguments and the affairs of the people. That, the, that was like, he would keep walking through the town having his eye focused on winning the next battle. I loved that. Don't get entangled in just arguments and discussions and just things that are going to take your focus off. Let's keep our eyes steady on Jesus. Paul goes on. He says, you're going to need the mindset of an athlete. Let's go to slide 37. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So with the soldier... It's focus. You need the focus of a soldier. But with the athlete, you got to compete according to the rules. Okay? That's the promise. The, the, or that's, that's, the, that's the command in this. The promise given to the soldier is if you do this, if you stay focused, you're going to please your commander. You're going to put a smile on his face. You're going to hear at the end of your life, well done, good and faithful servant. You're going to enter into the joy of your master. That's the promise to the soldier. The promise to the athlete is you're going to be rewarded. Paul uses this language of him in chapter 4. He says, I fought the fight. I ran the race. But guess what? I ran according to the rules, and I am going to be rewarded. I have finished the race. I have kept, which means to hold firmly to show oneself actually holding on to something. I have kept the faith. And Joseph, let's go on to the next slide. And Paul says, henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, the reward. Not only for me, he says, he says, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This wasn't going to be exclusive to Paul's life if you love the appearing of Jesus. Paul says it three times in 2 Corinthians, the appearing. He charges Timothy. He says, Timothy, by God and by Jesus who is going to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and by the kingdom, I charge you to preach the gospel. Are we loving the appearing of Jesus Christ? I think of this in two ways. Do we love the first coming and are we joyfully waiting upon the second coming? Do we love his appearing? He says, all those who do and respond with a life that is walking in a manner worthy of him are going to receive this crown. But we got to compete according to the rules. You cannot make up your own rules to the game. You just can't. When my children started to play soccer, I, I didn't grow up playing soccer, okay? In basketball, if you were dribbling and your foot went outside of the bounds and you touched the ball, then you're out of bounds. In soccer, you can go out of bounds and keep the ball in, 
I didn't know that. There's, and then there's this crazy hard rule I'm not going to try to explain. I still don't see it time and time again called offsides, okay? Okay, so my, my, my children were forwards, and they were, they were, they were running, and, and, and they would get the ball passed to them. And there's a certain way you have to pass the ball in soccer to not be offsides, and I would never see it. So they'd get the ball, and they'd score, and I'd be like, yeah! And I'd be the only one, like, cheering for them. Because the referee would have the offsides flag. And I'm like, offsides? They scored. But the ref said, no, they didn't. They're not playing according to the rules. We have to play according to the rules for our lives to matter. For us to receive the reward. We can't say, Jesus, this is going to be the way that I live out the gospel. We have to say, Jesus, how should I live out the gospel? And we got to run to the word of God. Last point. It is the hard-working farmer. This is slide 42. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. I love this. Let's go to slide 43. Paul says in another place, he says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from his own flesh corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. If you are the hardworking farmer, you want to sow the right seed. Amen? We want to sow the seed of the Spirit so that we can reap from the Spirit. We want to reap from the Spirit now, and we, we, we want to reap from the Spirit in the age to come. I want love. I want joy. I want peace. I want peace. I want peace. No, just kidding. I want patience. I want kindness. I want it all. I want to reap from the Spirit. But it's the hardworking farmer who sows that and then guards it. We've got to guard the weeds, guys. Let's go to the, the Mark passage. Of course, we, we say it a lot, but... Just the next slide, Joseph. Yeah. The weeds, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things. That's what the hardworking farmer has to get into the fields every day and, and get out. We got to get the weeds away from the crops. Amen? We want the good harvest. We want the harvest of the spirit. But we can't dabble in the cares of the world, in the deceitfulness of riches, in the desires for other things, it will make us unfruitful farmers. That's what Paul's telling Timothy. Don't be an unfruitful farmer. Be a fruitful farmer who enjoys the, the, uh, the harvest. Amen? Well, why don't we stand? I just want to pray this over you. If we could have the ministry teams come down to the front. I want to encourage you, probably something, as I was speaking, or even, as, even before, if you weren't a part of that first ministry time and you want to respond to the Lord, probably something was coming up in your mind when I was talking about entrusting the gospel to faithful men. When I was talking about making disciples, not just living or not just saying and living the gospel yourselves, but doing the work of preaching the gospel and making disciples of others, doing the good works that God has called us to do. I want to encourage you. I'm just going to pray for you. I'm going to have Sean play for a bit. But if that's you, come down and receive ministry and receive prayer. Or maybe you just want to come down and just respond personally. I am going to be about the good works that are going to bring my Father glory. I'm going to be about entrusting the gospel. Mothers to daughters, fathers to sons, co-workers to co-workers, entrusting the gospel to others. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that we can run to you for strength and for grace. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the vine. 
We thank you that the Father sent you to empower us, that the Father sent you to give us a holy calling to bring us into the family. We thank you that when you came, you abolished death and you showed us what life is and you showed us what eternal life is and you brought it to light through your ministry. Jesus, just as you made Paul a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of this, Lord, we say, consume us with the gospel. We say, let us live the gospel. Let us preach it. And let us pull others into obedience. Let us do the good work of making disciples, Lord. We ask you for grace to do this. And we pray for the mentality of the soldier. Lord, give us focus. Let us be single-minded. Let us flee youthful passions and let us pursue righteousness. And Lord, we ask you that we would have grace to compete according to the world rules, but that we would have our eyes set on the prize, the crown of life. Just as you, Jesus, ran the race and had your eyes set on the joy that was set before you. Give us that same grace. And Lord, I ask you that we would be hardworking. I ask you that we would get up every day in secret with no one looking, no accolades, no one knowing, Lord. But we're saying no to sin and we're saying yes to righteousness. In secret, Lord, we're dialoguing with you in the car. We're dialoguing with you at the gym. We're dialoguing with you, Lord, in the morning and in the evening. We're, we're doing the hard work, that secret work of sowing to the Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would raise our faith in this season that we are going to reap from the Spirit. I pray that we would be looking and having faith to reap. When, are, when am I going to reap today? When am I going to reap righteousness today? When am I going to reap reap the rewards of sowing into the Spirit. Lord, raise our faith. You are the God that are able. We love you and we worship you. Amen and amen. Love you guys.